Okay, I'd like to call the, the meeting of our Standing Committee of Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability to order. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome the Federation of Agriculture, but before we start, we'd like to uh, basically have an adoption and a, uh, an approval of the agenda. So, okay, uh, moved by uh, Jamie. Do, do we need a seconder for that? No? Okay, we're good to go. Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome the PEI Federation of Agriculture here uh, to uh, make a presentation on some of the challenges that many of our farmers are facing in Prince Edward Island. And uh, we certainly uh, appreciate Alyssa for her work in uh, trying to make an arrangements and the expediency of your willingness to come and present to us. Uh, uh, that's uh, um, impressive on my end, for sure. Certainly, it's usually a challenge sometimes to get presenters to uh, be here uh, and schedule it all in. But anyway, I guess I'd want to uh, introduce and welcome uh, some of the people that are here. Uh, we have uh, Vice President Philip Hamming of the PA Federation of Agriculture, past president Ron Maynard, uh, and uh, executive director uh, Donald Killorn uh, from the... PEI Federation of Agriculture. So anyway, uh, we have an agenda and they are the first to uh, make the presentation. So uh, I will turn the floor over to them and maybe I'll, even though I've introduced you, maybe you should, uh, for the record, uh, although there seems to be some feedback <laughs> here, uh, for the record, just to identify yourselves. And, uh, and uh, I'm told you're going to kind of give a, a kind of a longer presentation, but you're going to break it down into maybe five or 10 minute snippets and then open it up for questions. So if if the uh, our committee is acceptable to that, we'll try to keep our questions relatively brief, but uh, just never know what a particular subject might, uh, we might want to extend that. Uh, so, Donald, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, my name is Donald Killorn. I'm the... We are hearing feedback. <laughs> Pull the um, keyboard away from the microphone. Check, check. Can you bring it close to yourself? Nope. The, uh, maybe we'll take a quick recess. Do we need them in August after transit? Do we have technical support? Yeah, yeah. maybe we'll have a quick, quick recess, recess to uh, ask for some technical support here to reduce our feedback. <laughs> You're wired for sound, Donald, maybe. <laughs> okay, quick gadget. Uh, uh, Assume uh, where we left off. Sorry, I apologize for that, but it looks like uh, I don't hear it like I used to. Uh, oh. yeah, it might be still a little bit. But anyway, we'll go back to Don. Thank you. I'm Don. <laughs> I'm Don Killorn. I'm the executive director of the. Can I suggest? Is your mic on? Your your Don. Is your mic on? We don't. I don't think we turn. Turn yours off and then turn with the side ones on. Like. I'm not, I'm not sure we can control it. No. Uh, okay, we'll have another quick recess again. Uh, Trevor, maybe you can figure out what's... Uh
<laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. They, so they just turned the speakers back. Oh, no. There we go. Now they're off. If the, if well, I'm waiting for a thumbs up from them, but now I can start to hear the echo in again. The microphone? No. Like, see, there it is. Oh, yeah. See how it's on now? <laughs> oh, does this artificial have intelligence? It feels like a ghost, like, yeah. detect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had it there. They're yeah. volume, yeah, volume, yeah. <laughs> Whatever that was. Yeah, maybe that's maybe it's the oh, water. Yeah. 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 <laughs> He's like, totally this thing. Check, check. check. <laughs> oh, the speakers were off. Good. Well done. Sorry about that, folks. In our uh, <coughs> committee meeting, and uh, we'll start off where we left off, which we never really got started. Uh, pass it pass back over to Executive Director Donald Killorn. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm the Executive Director of the PEI Federation of Agriculture. Uh, I'll be giving uh, the presentations today. Uh, there are four topics and that we were uh, asked to present on, and so I'll go through each one, and then we can stop for questions. And uh, I'm joined uh, on either side of me. Philip, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Philip Hamming. I'm the Vice President of the PEI Federation of Agriculture. And I'm Ron Maynard, uh, past president of the PEI Federation of Agriculture. Uh, we apologize today for, uh, from uh, our president, uh, Keisha Rose uh, Topping, who was unavailable uh, uh, today because of, because of the rather short notice that we were, uh, that we were given. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'll begin if we're ready. Yeah. So I want to thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the invitation and the members of the committee for having us in today. Um, these are four important topics uh, to our, our farmers. And so we're, uh, we're pleased to uh, be able to be here and uh, brief the committee on them. Uh, our organization, the PEI Federation of Agriculture, does represent more than 500 uh, island farm families and 17 commodity organizations. Uh, it's a diverse membership. Uh, many of them are fifth and, uh, sixth and seventh generation farmers. Uh, some are small operations, um, some are larger, some are just beginning. Many are well established. It, it really is a diverse group. Uh, quite a large group, and uh, our mission as an organization is to ensure the sustainability of their operations, and, uh, and each of the topics we're going to talk about today does address that. Uh, you will see some themes uh, through the four topics, uh, things like labor, um, and labor will be a big one that you, you, you see access to capital. Um, so those will be solutions to, to a lot of these problems, but um, I'm going to give you some details on what we're facing and, uh, and what we can do together to, uh, to address them. So the first that we'll deal with is the loss of farmland on Prince Edward Island. Uh, we are losing farmland uh, here at a very, uh, really a dangerous rate. Um, it's a rate that we haven't seen, we've only seen once before in the 1970s. Uh, we lost 12.3% of our farmland uh, over the, the uh, between 2016 and 2020, 2021. So during that census period, we went from 260,000 hectares to just over 200,000. And so at that current rate of loss, you know, by 2040, we'll only have about 120,000 acres, uh, hectares remaining. Uh, so that's, that's really dangerous. You know, this is Prince Edward Island's most valuable natural resource, right? We don't have minerals, you know, what we have here, how we produce economic impact is with the land, with good agricultural land, which is what we've been blessed with. Um, the loss of farmland does have, um, a pretty dramatic spin-off effect on our uh, economy on Prince Edward Island. Our economic impact is really divided uh, between uh, what we produce on farm and then the processing of those goods. So value-added processing is a critical part of our economic impact. So um, <coughs> things like Cavendish Farms, uh, ADL, Wyman's, um, the uh, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Beef Products, those are four of our big processing facilities. And, and so they account for a huge part of our economic impact. And they have, you know, they have 
a critical amount of feedstock that they need from Prince Edward Island to ensure that those operations are economically viable for those companies. And so maintaining farmland isn't just about ensuring that our farmers have enough land, but it's about ensuring that our economic impact remains what it is. And again, that's our most valuable resource. Um, and if we don't protect it, we will see significant drops um, in, in the economic performance of the province. The other big piece um, with, with preserving farmland is the environmental piece. Uh, so our farmers are, it, it's increasingly well known the role our farms play in, um, in ensuring uh, good stewardship of the environment. Uh, so the, the provincial government's net zero goals, biodiversity goals, they really depend on farmers implementing best management practices on those lands. Um, best management practices like crop rotation, rotational grazing, cover cropping. When we improve soil health, we, sequ we sequester greenhouse gases. Uh, and, and as we expand our hedgerows and our buffer zones and other ecologically sensitive areas, that's really going to contribute to uh, our native species and their habitat. So when we lose farmland, whether you know, it's often converted into residential development, we lose those environmental co-benefits. And so when we're thinking about sustainability of Prince Edward Island, you know, farmland loss is, is something that we, we have to consider both economically and environmentally. And then socially, you know, our farmland is really, it's a part of our identity, you know, and, and so not to, not to make it about the economy again, but tourism is, you know, does depend greatly on the way our farmers maintain the landscape. So when a tourist is here, they see the rolling fields, you know, they see the, the farm animals um, on the fields, you know, that's, that's a big part of the, of the uh, experience that they have. And I'm sure you all have a favorite drive, you know, on Prince Edward Island. Like when I drive Route 20, you know, it's just not, won't be the same, right, without that, without that landscape. So lots of, um, lots of good reasons for us to protect our farmland. Um, now, we've made progress on this, in, and we'll see this with a few of the issues. There's been progress made around planning. And, uh, you know, the provincial land use plan was something and is something that is discussed quite a bit. Uh, certainly during the most recent provincial election, it was our big issue as a, as a sector. Um, and, the, and the work of the Land Matters Committee was completed in 2021. And they published a report that was, uh, we think, very well done. And we urge the government to continue to adopt the recommendations of that committee. There are recommendations that could be adopted today, and I'll quote, uh, the government could implement interim measures to regulate subdivision and development in areas without an official plan until a province-wide land use planning, uh, planning framework is adopted. So what that means is that you could basically take the province and, and sort of treat it like a, a development moratorium while we address um, these land use issues. Because as I said, we lost 12% of our land, our farmland, between... Um, between 2016 and 2021, and there's no reason to think that that rate's not continuing or even accelerating, oh, yeah. you know, and we, we can't keep the data, we can't be up to date on the data, but there's no reason to think that this isn't happening right now. So by adopting um, a moratorium on, on subdivision development in areas without an official plan, that would limit unchecked ribbon development and, and slow the loss of our farmland directly. And so that term ribbon development if you, if you look at a map of Prince Edward Island and where people live and, and you have the residences and the roads and you pull the roads off the map, what you'll see is these ribbons of development all, you know, sort of outside of our municipalities. And, uh, and so what we're seeing is farmland being developed along roads and that's where residents are going. And, uh, and so when we say ribbon development, which is a term we use a lot when we talk about the loss of farmland, that's what, we're, that's what we mean is these long ribbons along our, along our roads um, where, where, the, where the new homes are going. So when the provincial land use plan is completed to address that ribbon development, we think it should institute provincial jurisdiction over resource land. Uh, uh, this includes forests and farmland when we talk about resource land. Decisions about that resource land, forests and farmland, in its usage, would then be made by provincial authorities, which, and, and those decisions would be made for the benefit of the whole province. And again, farmland isn't something that just benefits a municipality. It, it really is the, you know, it's an economic, uh, it's a very important economic driver for the whole province. And as such, we think the, the provincial government should be the one making decisions about its usage and how its usage changes. 
Now, once we have an effective provincial land use plan, um, we think it should it, sh it will focus more population into our municipalities by disincentivizing development outside of municipal boundaries. So there's very strong, uh, we have these postage stamp municipalities in our rural areas, places that could be really thriving, um, but because of municipal tax, it disincentivizes people to build inside the municipalities. And the municipalities are so small, you know, I'm thinking about Morrell or Surrey, um, O'Leary, but because the municipalities are so small and there's such a strong financial incentive to build outside of them, that's driving this ribbon development. Uh, so by, 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 um, by encouraging population inside of those municipalities, possibly by increasing their size, this will increase the municipal tax base, it will allow for improved provision of services inside the municipality, and it will lower the provincial maintenance costs for sprawling rural residential areas. So all these roads that we're putting houses on, we now have to maintain those roads. And so there's a serious long-term cost to this uh, rural residential sprawl that's not only, um, that is, you know, destroying our farmland. So increasing municipal population through expanded municipalities and increased density is the only way our province can accommodate 200,000 islanders alongside a thriving agricultural industry. We don't have to choose between those two outcomes. We just have to ensure that our municipalities are designed to um, incentivize development inside their boundaries and that inside those boundaries the development can be um, zoned or you know, we can allow for the density uh, that's required to accommodate this continued population growth. So I think it's pretty clear that protecting our farmland is possible, it's well within our reach, and it's a critical piece of uh, protecting our economy and our environment. And uh, no doubt our farmers all need uh, access to agricultural land to ensure um, their viable operations. So that's the farmland loss piece. It's, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's probably, uh, it's pretty scary. Um, you know, and so I think it's important to understand kind of the wide-ranging imp uh, implications and also how simple it would be to, to begin to address it today. So happy to take any questions on the loss okay, of farmland. Uh, I'll start. I'll go with Carla first and uh, open it up to Hal and then Hilton and Jamie and Susie. Okay, Carla. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for coming in today. I have been, we had the, um, the Federation of Municipalities came in <coughs> to see us uh, I don't know, a month ago maybe. And it was the first time I laid eyes on that map that you're talking about. And that for me was a clincher. And because it was such a, vis I'm a visual learner, obviously, but that's what really drove home to me how much this matters when you see what our island looks like. And that was an old map. So I, I, there's a new map coming, I'm told, with to see what that looks like now. And it, I'm actually kind of scared to see what that looks like. And I'm kind of all over the place with this because this matters a whole lot for a whole bunch of reasons, like you mentioned. I'm wondering, this is kind of an obvious question, but in your, in your words, what are, what are your main concerns? What does this, if we continue going in the, the way we're going, where our population is soaring and we continue developments willy-nilly, we're completely, in some areas, we've lost the character of the island in some areas. And so I'm wondering if you could explain to us what it means, what, what does it mean if we continue down this path? What does it mean to the island, to the people, to the, to the economy, um, to the industry? Well, I, I think in our presentation we pointed out it's, it's both economical, it's social, and it's, you know, we are an island. There's no more land to, we're, in fact, we're losing land quite dramatically from every storm that we see. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's time for action. Uh, that's my th th thoughts and feelings on it. I mean, we need to have... <laughs> the other aspect of it is that this ribbon development causes other, uh, other complications also. Because, I mean, if I'm, if I'm farming going with my manure spreader or my sprayer, you know, uh, these people... Uh, that are at the end of all my fields uh, don't appreciate me going with those items. And so you get uh, uh, the aspect of being uh, uh, tensions between both on both the farmer's side and on the, on the residential side. And I guess the, the unchecked development, I mean, I've said it here before, I mean, there's a road coming off of Blue Shank Road that goes, it's called, it's called the Cairns Road, it goes into uh, Kensington. You know, 
there's houses along there. I don't go on the road anymore because it, it bothers me so much. <coughs> there's houses, three acre lots. When I was, you know, when I was working for the provincial government uh, many, many years ago, that was a viable farm, a very good farm. And now it's three acre lots, and there's one house on the three acre lot. I mean, we can't afford this any longer in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Prince Edward Island. We have to have some, some controls. And, you know, we realize very clearly that people have, have to have a place to live, and we want to grow our population, but you know, uh, we need to go, go higher density, we need to go up. I mean, you know, that's our thought, is that the land has got to come uh, as the first, uh, not as an afterthought. Hal? Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks for the presentation. Um, it was very educational. A lot of the questions I had, you, you actually answered them. But you mentioned about 12% uh, loss in farmlands from 2016 to 2021. I think in recent studies have shown an average of 30 acres a day of farmland is lost here in Prince Edward Island. So what point does farmland, or farming, I guess, um, uh, become unviable at this rate? Well. Our economic, so we're, agriculture is responsible for a third of the economy in Prince Edward Island, and that's split pretty evenly between um, processing and, and uh, farm gate receipts. The, each, of the, each of the processing facilities I mentioned would come in here and tell you that they are at the edge of their ability to operate sustainably with available feedstock on Prince Edward Island. Um, the, the, the number, the tipping point number, you know, we don't, we don't know that. It would certainly be a great, uh, a great question to have answered, mm -hmm. to, to really understand that. Um, but again, we're, we're experiencing population growth at a, ra at, a, at a really strong rate, and that's a great way to grow the economy. You know, it, you, it's a great way to grow the GDP. And we don't have to do it at the expense of farmland. So, you know, we don't want to push up against a crisis. We, we, we don't want to push up against the crisis. We need to adopt good land use planning to allow the continued growth, the effective growth of our population. Mm -hmm. And that needs to happen with, our, with partners in the municipal governments. And, and the, the relationship between the Federation and the Federation of Municipalities is one that hasn't always been there, but it's definitely, we definitely share, you know, solutions and, 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 and common issues. So I'd love to get the, I'd love to be able to answer that question with like, with data. But really the fact is, if you talk to our processing partners, you know, we're already at, at a critical mm -hmm. point in terms of how much we can produce. Farming all over the world is going to be expected to do more with less. Like, you know, there's no question. But, um, you know, the nature of our province will, it's, we can't, we can't sustain ourselves here by giving up 12% of our farmland every five years. It's, it's, and it doesn't have to be that way. I think that's the most important thing. This is, it's not either or. It's not, it's not growing the GDP through population growth or maintaining 33% of our economic impact through agriculture. It's doing both, you know, and growing the impact. We're going to continue to produce more on per, per hectare as an industry. We're going to continue to grow our impact. We just have to be given the opportunity to do so. Like, just save, you know, save the land for us so that we can do it. And again, you don't... It doesn't mean that you can't grow the population to 200,000. It's easier to grow the population to 200,000 if you adopt the things we're talking about. If you are pushing people into morale, if you're pushing new development into into O'Leary and uh, and those places in Surrey. I mean, those are all wonderful places to live, but they're the size of a postage stamp. They're trying to they're trying to support rinks. They're trying to support um, fire departments. And, and meanwhile, the government's now expected to pave you know twice as many roads as it was 10 years ago. So. It's just the the solutions are the solution is clear and the benefits are obvious and so we're just we're the canary in the coal mine you know that's here to say like you know you're putting our economy at risk by trying to grow our economy and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, that's a good good analogy, uh, Helton. Um, off that twelve percent of the land that's you're, we're losing, do you know what the percentage would be on foreign? 
buyouts, like her foreign investments? Well, that would be a pretty... I don't. The answer yeah. is no. I mean, that's these are the, both those questions are interesting pieces of data analysis that I would encourage the government to undertake if you wanted to. Um, we know sort of, like, we're losing... It's a lot of pasture land, you know, okay. and, and so that'll speak... When we start to talk about cattle, like, it, it's, it's a lot of pasture land because for reasons, you know, for that reason, but that's still good farmland that could be yeah. converted into crop production rather than being lost entirely. But I don't know what percentage would be lost to foreign ownership. Okay. I guess the other aspect of it is foreign ownership doesn't mean that the land is not being productive. I mean, oh, no. that's, I mean, I think what we've got to do, we've got to take, the question is, what divide up that 12%, that 12, uh, you know, percent, what, where did it go? I mean, I think we need to, to, to dig further into that as far as the stats go. Uh, do we, I don't think we have that information, we just have the overall. I, but the information is probably there somewhere. Well, I guess sure. I, I should have asked what percent is, is going in the development, foreign investment going in the development, not going back into farmland. Okay. That's what okay. I should have said. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, but we don't, I don't think we have that. No. No. Like different types of agriculture. Yeah. We, know we're, we, can, we know what type of agricultural land we're losing. We have that level of data. Yeah. Uh, again, this is um, census data from Statistics Canada. So these topics are really about, they're, they're just dealing with the agricultural industry across the country. And so we get the PEI lens on that. And certainly the um, provincial government would have the capacity to do okay. more types of data analysis around the loss. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go to Jamie Fox. And just a reminder that I guess when we're switching back and forth is to identify uh, who's right. speaking. Sorry. <laughs> the microphone, our staff are having a little bit of a challenge trying to figure out uh, who to attribute what statements to. So uh, the chair recognizes Jamie Fox. It, it, if they're good, I will take them. If they're not, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Donald is the man. You guys are a walk in the park compared to my board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Fox. Well, I'll start tough and throwing the tough questions out. We're, I think we're into, I think we're into a, a, a predicament in the province. I just come back from Taiwan back a couple months ago. And they're now, they've, they've realized how important farmland is or arable land. And they now are totally protecting farm and arable land. So if you want to put a highway across something or a bridge or a subway or something, if Christian Freeland's uh, listening, we don't have no subways in PEI, um, they, you cannot, you have to go above the land. You cannot disrupt the farmland. And I sort of wonder if there's not a disconnect between some departments when it comes to issuing of permits that take farmland out of production. And one case in point is the special planning areas. They are seven of them in the province. Municipalities have raised a concern when I was a minister and what we're seeing is developments now leapfrogging outside the, outside the cities past the special planning areas into areas of farmland where are never going to be part of a, a municipality. Have you ever had the conversation with anybody in government, whether it be the Department of Lands or the Premier's office or somebody, on how this type of development leapfrogging outside our municipalities, past our special planning areas, out into rural PEI is impacting our arable land. Have you ever had that conversation? Oh, Ron Maynard. Uh, yes, we have, and that's the reason why <coughs> we suggested very, very strongly that there has to be a provincial resource land, and it has to be controlled by the province. Because that's what we're, we're, we're seeing that. And it's exactly, exactly as you were... Uh, as you're saying, uh, Jamie, you know, as, as in our presentation, we're going outside the municipal areas because it's, it's cheaper, less regulations maybe. So I think we have to have a, a provincial resource, you know, land for agriculture and forestry has to be zoned as, as that in a, on a provincial-wide basis. Thanks, Chair. Supplement, supplement I mean, that, question, that, that's, that's something that's in our in our standing. Uh, you know, when I was here before, talking about it also, and then the land matters uh, group suggested the same uh, recommendation. Something else that concerns me is, and I ran into it when I was Minister of Fisheries, is 
we, we need to grow a population, and it is happening, and, and, and we welcome that. However, it's causing conflicts in the aquaculture industry when it comes to new residents moving into the province. They buy a place on a shore, and they don't want to look at the oyster buoys or the mussel socks out in the water. So they would come to me and ask me to move them. And I said, we've got to start having a conversation with our lawyers and our real estate agents to say, this is what PEI is. If you buy this piece of land, this is what could be subject around you, either in front of you on a water or beside you in a farm. Case in point, back about, I want to say about three or four weeks ago, I had a, a newcomer come to my house. The, the barn door was open, the constituency office open, and he wanted to talk to me about a farmer next door to him stockpiling piles of manure from the cattle farm prior so that when he when the crops come off then he could plow it in and put it out there. And this resident was quite upset over having to deal with that. And I said, mm, excuse me, but this is the province of Prince Edward Island. We value our agriculture community. I don't think we support our agriculture community as much as we should in some cases. But I explained to him that this is a practice in PEI. And I'm wondering, should we not be having that conversation from the Federation with our real estate agents or the associations, or being the Barrister Association or the, or the Real Estate Association, and say, we should be educating the people coming into the province on what PEI is all about. And I wonder if there's been any thoughts about that, so that we sort of, you know, get rid of them, some of them, people are aware of that, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. So Donald Kalorn, um, the the education piece of the real estate agents and the and the attorneys perhaps would have value to prepare the people who are coming. However, um, the if we had province wide land use planning, we we would we would be able to keep those people away from the farms. Mm -hmm. And not that we need to, you know, not, not that there's any reason, but, you know, not, not that we're concerned about, it's not our concern of them being close, it's, it's our farmers know that those conversations are happening. Mm. And, and interestingly, some of them, they con they're concerned about rural amalgamation because they feel that it, mi it might get worse. And, <clears> but what I tell them is, actually, this is going to fix this problem, you know, because we're going to have agricultural land and the residences are going to be inside the municipalities. And so we can address exactly what you're talking about. And, and sure, education of those, of those um, people in the, in the, in the industry would, would perhaps help. But more importantly, we're going to address that through a provincial land use plan. I mean, again, you, you just nailed it right in the head about why we need one. You know, we, we, have, we have the economic activity, like Ron said, when he's, when he's, when he's, um, when he's working his fields, you know, we're, we have to stop that from happening. Like, that's the root of the problem. Okay, Susie Dillon. No, I'm going to go to Susie here. We get... <laughs> um, so my question is maybe a little bit more um, uh, gathering some more information. I, I'm just curious to know if, if a farmer owns a piece of land and they come to the age where they want to retire and they don't want to farm anymore, do they have, like, if that... That land isn't zoned farmers, like it doesn't have to stay agricultural, does it? Is it zoned for that or are they, do they have the ability to sell it to whomever? Like, I guess my question would be, are we losing some of our farmland because people don't want to farm anymore? And so when people get to the time of retirement and they sell their farm and somebody buys their land and they don't turn it back into farmland and they take it and build a subdivision on it, is that part of the problem. Yes, Federation. Ron, Ron Maynard. Yes, <clears throat> I mean that's and that's why we need provincial resource land zone resource land because that's exactly what's happening. Uh, it's it's the person that's retiring is is probably going to sell it to the highest bidder that's available. Okay, so if the highest bidder available is, is this is zone farmland, so it has to go to farmland. Then you know. It's farmers. It's 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 Hilton. It's myself. It's Philip. It's it's all our members that have the opportunity of buying it. And I don't know of any any uh, farmland that's come up for sale that hasn't sold. 
just my understanding, I think farmland is, a, is a identified as agricultural land, and, and if somebody's wanting to take it out of agriculture, production has to de-identify it into another zone. Yeah. Is, is that correct? Yeah, and so, so that's, that's what we're saying, is it has to be a much more rigorous process to take that out of, out of and uh, it needs to be a, a, more di a more difficult process to do that, and it has to be done on a provincial basis. Mm. Did you want to clarify something? There, well, Susie? I just wanted to say. So then, are you, are you uh, would you have to go to a farmer and say, you know, we're going to designate your land as agricultural land, so when you go to sell it, you can only sell it as farmland? Like, yeah. would they have to buy into that? Yes. Okay. And that's that. So, that is an issue that we've had a debate that we've had with our members, but I think it's come to a point now that that yeah. Brad Trivers, I know you're a little late arriving, but is there anything you want to? Add into this question. We're, we're doing a roundtable, and then we might have one or two yeah. supplemental, and then we're going on to the next you, chair. Time. I appreciate it, and uh, my apologies for being tardy today. <clears throat> um, but uh, and I, I didn't really see a lot of the the presentation, but I I I've been briefed on the issues before. I think that you're talking about, and I mean, one of the things uh, that we talk about, you know, um, is making farming, you know, appealing. For that next generation and bring interest in different. Just one thing that uh, that occurred to me today, just um, uh, is, for example, over over in Europe they do things like they use uh, biogas that comes off of operations, like dairy operations, for example, and they use that to generate energy and it provides an additional source of revenue in some cases, and plus it can contribute to reducing, you know, greenhouse gases and all those good things. Um, I'm just wondering um, what sort of initiatives like biogas and those sort of things is the PEI Federation of Agriculture sort of uh, exploring to kind of um, expand the, uh, the scope of, of farming and, and support those sort of innovative ideas on PEI. I know it's a bit out, outside uh, the scope perhaps, but uh, just curious. Well, it's the, uh, that our next, uh, the next section is about young farmers and, and the future of ag and careers in agriculture. And one thing I uh, will mention is the opportunity to support um, agriculture technology through venture capital or, um, you know, uh, commercialization of, of um, innovative research that's happening here and elsewhere. Uh, in terms of, we're, we're, we're pretty far down the line to producing the some of the first soil carbon credits um, in Canada. Um, which is exciting, and uh, we, we've done some pretty innovative modeling around our greenhouse gases and our ability to reduce them, and so I'd say we're leaders there, um, and you know, we want to continue to champion technology that allows us to manage that and, and reduce it, and so, um, you know, and we've distributed, as I'll mention, we've distributed uh, almost $5 million in federal funds to our farmers to implement on-farm climate practices so we're you know we're we're designing a sustainable agriculture industry on Prince Edward Island um, that's is going to be really appealing to the next generation of citizens you know we, we have a generation in at university now and, and coming behind them where environmental sustainability is extremely important to them and there's going to be an opportunity for them to make a real difference in how we manage uh, the environment while growing the economy uh, here on Prince Edward Island, so our sustainability work, I think, is what's positioning us uh, in that regard. Yeah. Great. You just wanted the one question. Just a little clarification, yeah. And, uh, okay, great. That, that, that's just, good. You're good. Okay. Uh, okay. If, Ron Maynard, if I may further <clears throat> on that biodigester, I mean, we unfortunately we're the only province in Canada that doesn't have an on-farm biodigester. Wow. Uh, the reason is rather simple, is because. Uh, and I've looked at it, uh, of doing it on our farm, the economics is not there. Because I sell my electricity, I sell it, have to sell it for the same uh, price that the, the large windmills uh, farms are getting, which is seven and a half to nine and a half cents. You know, other places are getting 25 cents per kilowatt per bio, gas by Now there is a, a program right now that we are looking at <coughs> in producing uh, renewable natural gas. Uh, and this has, uh, uh, there is some opportunities there that may, uh, uh, may uh, alleviate that uh, 
economic uh, uh, restraint that has been on Prince Edward Island because of the, of the competition with the large wind farms. Okay, uh, I will open it up just if there's one more question that's really a poignant question re regarding the subject because they have a number of subjects to go through here. So, Jamie, you had something, and Carla, you're kind of mentioning, but uh, is it really a, a critical point that hasn't been raised here yet? Or? Um, it's a quick okay. question. What's that? Quick question. Quick question. I'll allow, I'll allow Carla first, then Jamie second, then. That's okay. it. Um, I had two that I was going to try to shove into one, but just to follow up, um, you know, the... I'm wondering about, well, first of all, it's unfortunate. I wonder if there's other jurisdictions in the world where land is so politicized as it is here, which is a huge disadvantage to us, but that's just a side note. When a farmer decides to sell their land for whatever reason, they are getting out of farming or whatever, and they're selling, they're gonna sell it off into lots or whatever, and it has to go through that land zoning change. We, I'm assuming that there's nothing that we have in place right now that would alert us to say, ooh, ooh, you know, here's some potential farmland loss. There's not, we don't have any mechanism like that currently. I don't believe so. No, <clears throat> no not, not in on. Uh, Ron Maynard? <laughs> Ron, not in on uh, uh, outside of municipality. No, there isn't. Okay, okay Jamie? I wonder if you have an idea. Like, you know, I know of a family farm. Father died, three sons, one's not into farming, two others are. The second brother decided he doesn't want to be in farm anymore. He offered to sell it to the third son. Third son has three boys. Three boys don't want to have nothing to do with farming anymore. Mm, now what do I do? Sell it off. Then you got the you got the other farmer who wants to retire, has no built-up retirement fund, and that's the way of his retirement fund is to sell the farm. So I'm wondering any. Any quick idea on how, how you deal with that type of situation? Or is there a role of government there, or is there not? Well, we could expand tax uh, incentives. Uh, if you're keeping it as agricultural land, we could expand tax incentives beyond uh, just interfamily transfer um, to uh, just transfer to maintain agricultural land. You know, there's lots of farms on Prince Edward Island that are planning their succession around their longest and, and, and most trusted employees are going to own the farm. Mm -hmm. um, and you lose a lot of tax incentive once you're outside the family. Now, that's federal jurisdiction. Um, so, again, this is, a, this is a matter of the whole. You know, we have to protect the agricultural land. And the value of the land is not lost to the point about Taiwan and, and other jurisdictions. Farmland has exploded in value all over the world because of just what you said about the scarcity of arable land. It's a global issue. And uh, our farmland, um, like so much of our land, has been undervalued for so long. We're not going to have any <coughs> trouble selling farmland as farmland. We just have to make sure we keep it as farmland and not, not five lots at a time turn it into residential subdivision, rural residential subdivision. Hmm. Okay, uh, no, I'm going to uh, inter intervene there at this point. And as chair, I'm going to take the liberty of asking one key question, I think, that hasn't really been addressed here. As many farmers, and being one in my past, uh, my land is my equity. And the more restrictions you put on land, the more it has an impact on the equity that I might have. Now, in my time farming, we had a, an, an issue that occurred called BSE, mad cow. Lost a lot of money in the agricultural industry. Had to make some decisions. Uh, had to make a decision to maybe sell a lot to try to free up some cash flow to pay some bills, right? Um, so those two factors in being able to borrow money, <laughs> your cash and, and cash flow, have have made decisions that maybe not all farmers want to do. But I do think that there has to be something that allows farmers in those situations to not lose their equity <coughs> and yet also be able to do something on some situations where they do get into a cash flow crisis. So what's the Federation of Agriculture's response and how you deal with that? Is there, you said tax incentives for selling, but, you know, if you're selling one, I don't want to, I didn't want to sell my whole farm. In my case, I just needed, you know, say $20,000 to get some cash flow going. Uh, and if, if my land values and, and agriculture are, say, today you're probably looking at about five to $8,000 on a worst case scenario on a on reasonable farmland, uh, 
lots, a building lot, I could probably get 20,000, maybe 30,000, and if I'm short frontage, maybe even more. How does that inter interfere with the ability of a farmer to be able to wiggle to get out of problems and things of that nature that were really of no cause of their own? <laughs> Ron? <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, I, th I think there has to be, a, you know, we're, we're, this is a provincial uh, uh, House of Legislature, but I think the federal business risk management programs have got to be agile enough to look after that. I mean, and that's the thing that we've talked about to the federal government and the Canadian Federation of Agriculture is still talking about revamping business, mis business risk management programs to take into account. Uh, we've talked we'll, a little bit later on, we'll talk about uh, Fiona. I mean, that's the, the ramifications there. The, 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 that's what we've got to, we've got to, the government has got to be able to step up when there is disasters like that, like, like Mad Cow, like Fiona, like flooding. You know? uh, so, I mean, that's, that would be my response to, to that. Uh, uh, may I? Okay, yeah, Philip. Uh, I sat, uh, uh, Philip Phil Hemming. Um, I sat on the Land Matters Committee, and uh, it became very clear that it's perfectly possible to put in legislature to protect farmland and many other things. But uh, there are issues like the one you bring up, or <laughs> the one that you bring up, of what is a farmer going to do? They want the best money for their land. Mm -hmm. um, and, but at, at what end? And so we're a farming organization, and so we want to protect the farmland ultimately. And, but there is a huge amount of conflicts with people who want their piece of land in the countryside. And I have a beautiful house in the countryside, and now I'm trying to stop other people from having their piece of land. And, and it's, 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 it's difficult, but, but the three-acre lots can't just keep happening because there just won't be any farmland left. And it's, it's very complicated, and there's people who want to be able to develop, and they want to be able to sell off a lot. But at, to what end? At some point, it has to end. So... I yeah, that's that's. For, for, we talk about you know doing this on a provincial basis. Every city, every town, like you can't develop a piece of land here in Charlottetown without having regulations. I mean, everything in, in within the city is zoned, and that's what we're asking about having every piece of land in the province zoned. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to go on and ask the federation to commence the next topic. Okay, so uh, we're moving on to um, youth and agriculture, uh, young farmers, agricultural careers. This is, uh, this is another uh, risk that we're facing, another serious risk that we're facing, the loss of farmland being one, and our aging farming population uh, in Prince Edward Island's agricultural sector. The average age of, uh, of our farmers is 56 years old, and that number continues to rise, which uh, means that farmers are not entering the business behind older generations. Um, the uh, primary barriers to entry for young farmers uh, are access to capital and access to land. So that, that decreasing uh, farmland is driving up the cost. It's making it very difficult for new entrants. Uh, there are opportunities for succession planning where young farmers uh, can in, you know can inherit or, or purchase the farm inside the family, and as we mentioned, there are tax incentives available there. Um, it does usually require some outside counseling to navigate that and, and get the farm passed down. But the fact is, um, we're coming through a generation where our farmers have encouraged their children to explore other opportunities, the, uh, the likes of which we've never seen before, and so we've got. Um, to, uh, to, to Jamie's point, you know, there are families where there's simply not people in place uh, that want to inherit the farm. Now, what, like I said earlier, do believe there's a, a generation coming after them that is very interested in agriculture, very interested in, in food and, and sustainability and environmental management, and they're going to identify agriculture as an opportunity to do that, to, to work at that. Um, but the, the federal tax benefits for interfamily farm transfer um, those, you know, the province needs to be sure that they're doing everything they can to follow suit. As well, low interest capital with delayed repayment terms for new entrants can definitely help mitigate startup costs and, uh, and shepherd farmers through their most vulnerable years in the industry. So those first few years. You know, we talked in Prince Edward Island in the past 
about a land bank and a land bank may not be tenable it may not be something that a provincial government can take on especially as the as the land gets more valuable but certainly what the people of Prince Edward Island can do to ensure the sustainability of agriculture and its economic impact is provide access to capital uh, capital that is um, you know secured that is um, loan like lent with terms that allow the farmer to establish themselves and especially as interest rates rise that's going to become more important if we want to facilitate uh, if we want to facilitate entrance of young farmers um, you know without without a land bank um, training programs mentorships internships those can all help develop skilled labor um, in agriculture and also provide networks uh, that young farmers can can use in difficult transitions. Uh, farmers, you know, all farmers, particularly young ones, benefit from uh, knowledge transfer, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we're currently working with the, the young farmers of PEI or what's left of it to try and revitalize that organization, and we see that as very much a part of our mission to ensure the sustainability. Um, you know, so, so supports outside of just farm purchase and operation, financial support of farm purchase and operation, you know, to facilitate entrance into the industry beyond just farm ownership. Um, for instance, we, you know, we suffer from a significant lack of large animal veterinarians. And so the provincial government could support more students at the Atlantic Vet College, uh, especially for large animal, for large animal um, vets. Uh, as well, something to consider, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the tuition assistance that we provide Prince Edward Islanders to attend UPEI, but the fact is that the types of programs that, that we need to promote agriculture are not available there. They're available at the Agricultural College in Truro. So considering providing support to, to students who are, um, who are attending the uh, DAL AC would definitely be something to consider. Now that's, that's post-secondary. Uh, we have to think about, you know, the image of our, the image of our, of our industry and, and why we've seen such a decrease in, in local labor. And I would propose to this group that, you know, there's no greater opportunity in engineering and, 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 um, and computer science today on Prince Edward Island than in agriculture. So, you know, we need, we need farm owners, you know, we need, you know, farm professionals, but agriculture is an opportunity outside of those, agriculture is a tremendous opportunity um, and the youth need exposure to these opportunities uh, to ensure that they view it as a viable option from a young age. So that means agricultural education should be considered in the curriculum from K to 12. Uh, that introduces the students uh, to the industry. We have a program on PEI called Ag in the Classroom. It's a provincial arm of a national program. It's a very strong national program. Here on PEI, it focuses primarily on grade three students, but that program would have significant room to grow and, and could provide uh, additional uh, opportunities for, for engaging uh, school, uh, grade school children. And then career development staff in schools. You know, those career development staff, we've all, uh, you know, up here, we've all heard anecdotally of guidance counselors steering people away from agriculture. And those, those career development staff must understand the scope and breadth of opportunity available to our students. You know, in agriculture, we have to ensure that the next generation of Islanders fully understands the opportunities available to them. And really, you know, that includes, as I said, it has to include innovation, it has to include entrepreneurship, you know, we have entrepreneurs on Prince Edward Island who are doing really cool things with ag tech. Um, Agile uh, is a company that is, is digitizing spray records. Um, we've got um, Bluefield Seed Solutions, who's done some things that are really impressive with, um, with potato seeding. Um, you know, we have those entrepreneurs here, but we would certainly benefit from a targeted investment in agriculture technology and that kind of startup culture. You know, there are entrepreneurs in San Francisco, in Toronto, they're looking at food and, 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 the, and, and information technology and, and the, our need for doing more with less land is a technology question. And so there are going to be massive opportunities to develop those technologies and we have to do whatever we can to not only bring those people to Prince Edward Island to develop their technologies alongside our farmers, 
you know, but also entice our own next generation of entrepreneurs to be working in agriculture. It's a we have a $600 million industry. It's a third of our economy. It has a tremendous need for technological innovation. And so we have to be ready to develop and commercialize ag tech here on Prince Edward Island if we want to grow the economy. Um, you know, it's probably the easiest way to grow the economic impact of of um, agriculture is the spin-off um, the spin-off technologies we need to continue to grow our productivity so um, it's it's a tough question new entrants I think k-12 to education is something that you know can't can't uh, can't deny is a critical part of it but then also that post-secondary piece and then those career outcomes in commute computer science and engineering you know those in within those sort of lie the answers of developing the next generation of farmers Okay, thanks, and I agree. Succession planning and things of that nature are really critical and encourage new entrants. But anyway, Jamie Fox first. I'm going to go with Jamie Hilton back in reverse, okay? Thanks, Jerry. Well, you hit a topic that is true to my heart, I'll tell you that. Back three or four years ago, I had the same, I had the aquaculture and fisheries say to me that we need to start educating our youth. And the Department of Fisheries, we brought forth a program, we worked with the Department of Education, and we're now teaching an introductory type of level aquaculture fisheries thing within the school system. The Department of Education wouldn't pay for it. So the Department of, Department of Fisheries, we said, we'll pay for it, we'll develop a curriculum. Can you develop a curriculum in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture that maybe possibly they could sponsor and pay for to introduce farming to our youth starting say from grade nine going forward can you develop that absolutely so how it's fast there. could we start working and recommend from the committee that we encourage the department of agriculture to work with the federation to develop a program for kids grade nine going forward on the benefits of getting in a farmer and bring it back from nova scotia into our into these students for the problems. I think it's I think it's a mm -hmm. move forward. Well, keep in mind as chair, we, we make recommendations right. to the legislature. It's the legislature that makes yep. the recommendations yeah. to the department. So it's up you know eventually follows up from that. But uh, anyway, okay, any response to that or you're, you're, <coughs> sounds good, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll second the motion if that's yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, chair recognized Hilton McClellan. <clears throat> well I did have a few but I think you pretty well it was on the ideas of getting youth into it. I think you touched a lot of it. The, um, what Jamie has said was is great idea. You know, it's super. I did have questions because I know years ago they did land banks, but as you said, that may be too expensive uh, given the price of farmland going higher. Um, but I agree with, you know, they need, the youth need more access to capital. Uh, definitely, definitely. I don't really have a question. I'm okay. sorry, but I, you, you've touched a lot of subjects that I uh, was wanting to touch on, but uh, uh, you got some good answers. Like, absolutely, okay. the right kind of capital. Chair uh, Rector Hal Perry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the presentation was great because it's answering all my questions. So <laughs> it's, it's really, it is really good. But one of the agriculture in the classroom, so you talked about that, and we talked about education in the school system. So I fully would support that, having it throughout the whole school program and part of their curriculum. Uh, so that's something I would support, um, but it would need the province to to to, to support it also um, on that. But there's a couple, of, uh, two. I'll ask a bunch of questions here in one. Um, so the farm and food uh, care is a great initiative that was put on by the federation or supported by the federation, uh, and uh, it's geared towards uh, like I guess public trust, right? Um, but it does expose families. To, to the farming industry. So can you just tell us a little bit more about this initiative, um, how the program is working, um, is it adu adequately funded, and um, do you think it's achieving its goals? No, Certainly yeah. operational. Yeah. yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, just want to, just wanted to get those down so I don't so miss any. Alarm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so <laughs> Uh, just again, uh, how is it performing? Is it adequately funded? Mm -hmm. uh, so for those uh, who aren't familiar with it, Farm and Food Care is a, a public trust initiative that's funded through the Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, so its, its goal is to 
is to connect all Prince Edward Islanders with um, with our with our agriculture industry and help them understand how we produce the food with their food and uh, and and again to grow social license for the industry. Um, I think that it is increasingly it's performing <coughs> increasingly well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that um, we have good partnership with the Department of Agriculture and they're they're doing they're doing um, is it adequately funded? Our partners at, at the Department of Agriculture are I think I think they appreciate it and they're doing their best to to keep it funded at a level that allows us to at least explore what it's capable of. Mm-hmm. I, I think that um, our goal with Farm and Food Care is to continue to prove to the department what we're capable of doing in hopes that we can bring in more investment. We partner with Farm and Food Care Ontario and Farm and Food Care Saskatchewan to try and bring in federal dollars to the program as well because we believe that the we I'm very confident in the farm and food care team that the more dollars I can get in their hands, the better they can meet their goals. And really their goals are to, they're not necessarily directed at new entrants. They're really directed currently at um, newcomers to Prince Edward Island, um, you know, uh, mothers of young families, uh, people inside the urban area. You know, that that's our strategic goal right now. And uh, we're trying to communicate um, the, we're trying to build social license around our foreign labor workforce. We're trying to ensure people understand that those people are here. They're having a positive experience here. We're trying to ensure that those people understand that we're managing our impact on the environment and, and show how we're doing that. And, the, um, and then we're trying to promote opportunities to access local food uh, so people know where they can find local food. And so we're taking that as our food security initiative as well. And so we feature um, not just farmers, although when we feature farmers, that's the content that performs the best. Uh, but we also feature researchers. Uh, we feature chefs. You know, we're trying to connect people, uh, again, all the way through the food system. So how is it performing? It's, it's performing better every day. Uh, and and if, if, we, if we had more funds for it, um, we would certainly leverage those into uh, an even greater piece. And we could look to use that uh, as a way to promote agriculture as a career path, but we're not currently using farm and food care. Uh, for that purpose, um, we partner with, um, again, with Ag in the Classroom via farm and food care. That's, that's, the, that's the arm of the PEIFA that really partners with Ag in the Classroom to try and promote that. So we're there to support Ag in the Classroom with our farm and food care resources, but we're not dealing with the next generation directly. Yeah, thank you. Any clarification or follow-up? Um, no, he's answered all okay, of those. Thank you. Carla Bernard. Thank you. Um, so it's funny how many times conversations lead me back to the same Next. thought, and that is how outdated our industrial revolutionized style of education is, because we have all of these things that should be in our curriculum. As a 23-year-old woman, just kidding, as a 46-year-old woman who grew up in a farming community, It wasn't until very recently that my eyes were opened up to all of the different things that I had never considered as part of agriculture, and that's a huge problem. And so one of the things that that, you know, we hear often is, well, that should be in the curriculum, that should be in the curriculum. But the way our, our system is designed, there's no room for anything else. So we need to take a step back and look at what are we teaching? Are these things still valuable in the 21st century? Um, and so agriculture to me is one of those. So often what will happen is, you know, we'll develop a new curriculum, it'll get put in, it'll keep people happy, but it's not actually, it's there as a supplemental. It's there for a teacher to use, you know, if they like, if they want some additional resources or whatever that looks like. And in many cases, speaking as an educator, if I'm not, if I don't have that background knowledge on a topic, if I'm not passionate about a topic, if I'm not all that interested in a topic, I don't have to do those things. And so a lot of our kids in our education system are kind of at the whim of which supplemental resources a teacher is going to use. And then other things get left out. And agriculture is absolutely one of those things. So, um, you know, I I think back to, I used to teach at uh, Kensington Intermediate Senior High School, and I can't remember the name of the agriculture program that they have there, Um, but it would really depend on the interest that year if they were going to have it or not. So it wasn't always available. 
And I also, it's making me think about this because as someone who went to Three Oaks Senior High School, there, I don't believe, to my knowledge, there were no agriculture programs offered. So I think it's often thought of as a rural thing. We don't need to talk about agriculture in urban areas and that's a problem too. So all that to say, I'm wondering about, are you ever included in any conversations, whether it be with the Department of Education, whether it be with um, you know, career explorations teachers or, um, like career counselors, are you ever at a table kind of able to, to push the importance of agriculture to ensure that people who are delivering these, this information or helping our students navigate that agriculture is a part of that discussion, part of that navigation? Have you ever given that opportunity? I've never been. No, uh, Ron Maynard, not, not in my uh, uh, t term. <laughs> We are there, did you say, when, when those uh, resource teachers come to us looking for information, we can most certainly provide it. And uh, you know, Jamie talked about, uh, about a curriculum. Yeah, those are, those are available right now. We can copy from some other, other provinces. Uh, that's, you know, tomorrow I can, I can have that uh, ready for you. Uh, but no, as far as sitting down with the Department of Education and saying, you know, this is a, a, a program that should be available in all schools, it has been to, and you know, Kensington High is, is one of the people, uh, you know, trainer uh, uh, was a teacher there that uh, had a program for many, many years. Uh, you know, uh, King Cora, of course, has, has had a program for many, many years. Uh, you know, but it's, 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 you need to have a teacher that's uh, uh, keen on that. And so that's been, the, been a uh, concern. Okay. Hey, Susie Dillon? Um, I feel as if, um, for some people, it might be a daunting exercise to want to get into farming in, in, a, in any kind of a capacity with fuel, fuel prices and um, best practices. And I also feel like trying to find people to come and work on your farm might be a difficult thing, too. So I'm just curious, as a federation, um, have you do you spend um, any amount of time researching um, different ways to have jobs automated within farming? Like, um, if you had a potato farm, can you find a way that the potatoes get sorted themselves so that you don't have to have actually somebody... Optical graders. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that, that, that would just be one. But as a federation, are you always exploring those new opportunities so that young farmers, when they come in, aren't feeling so overwhelmed with... Well, uh, we're here today advocating for yeah we're here today advocating for a development of a you know of a culture that that does just that you know we're not doing we're not engaged in in research and development around um, technology okay. per se today um, you know would I like to have five million dollars in a venture capital fund that the farmers control and that we invest in companies that are designed to help PEI farmers yeah I would. And, and I think we could do a lot of good with that. But, you know, we're not actively developing technologies ourselves. But to, to my point earlier, you know, we, we, need people, we need people that want to work on farm and, and understand that lifestyle. But also we need to think about the, you know, the teenagers in Charlottetown who are obsessed with startup culture and entrepreneurism and are seeing these people around the world start businesses and become billionaires. And that's what they want. And they can do it in agriculture. You know, not to not to be too grandiose, but like there's there's a, a there's a generation of people coming. We have a school of sustainable engineering at UPEI, and, and even outside of post secondary education, you know, there needs to be people on Prince Edward Island doing what you're saying. It's not necessarily going to happen at the federation. Although, if you told me, if you you know, if you gave me five million dollars, like we, you know, 50. if you gave us fifty million dollars, <laughs> thank you, Ron. Yeah, I forgot. I have to update my numbers. Um, so, um, again, you know, there's an opportunity here to grow our economy in, in information technology around agriculture that we're just letting sit, and people are going to bring businesses to. And, and our farmers are going to support businesses that are developed elsewhere. You know, there, you know, there's sensor technology for potato fields being developed in New Brunswick by three young men who aren't even graduated from UNB yet that we're all going to buy. You know, that every farmer on PEI that's growing potatoes is going to want to have. And that's just—it's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we're we're standing at the beginning of a 
of a, of a technology revolution in, in agriculture using satellite, using, uh, mm -hmm. using artificial intelligence, using machine learning. And, and yeah, you know, we do have, you know, we've got a, a couple of things, you know, where we're trying. Okay. I'll tell you this. <laughs> we are, one of our, one of our goals as a team, uh, is to standardize the, the, the storage and, and maintenance of agricultural data. Right. So that's one of our big goals going forward, not because we're going to be developing technology, but if somebody wants to develop uh, a decision management, artific an artificial intelligence decision management tool for agriculture, they're going to need a big data set around how things have been grown for 20 years, the decisions the farmer made so that we can train that model. And so we hope to develop that model as a way to facilitate growth. So that's what we're doing to develop in, you know, to develop that technology piece. But, um, you know, the government needs to be supporting people to actually come and use that data to create technology that then creates businesses, creates IP that's developed on PEI for PEI farmers and can be exported to other jurisdictions around the world. Just wanted to follow up really follow quickly. Up, yeah. Just to say that I think that's exciting because I think that there are an awful lot of kids that are techie that would like to uh, maybe incorporate both worlds. And, and it could be a supportive thing for agriculture and it can be a thing that engage kids to want to jump back into um, getting into the farms. Okay, okay. absolutely. Brad Trevers. Thanks, Chair. So I, I wanted to talk about the the career paths that are available in agriculture. And um, I mean, the... the Right now, maybe this is just the perception that's out there, is that you talked about the massive amounts of capital required to buy land, buy equipment, you know, there's all kinds of risks that are outside of your control, and you're a, it's, a, it's big business with millions and millions of dollars, and you're a business owner, with, which is, you know, there's all kinds of challenges with being an entrepreneur and a business owner, and farmers are all of that. And that's, I think, perception is that's what a farmer is. And then there's the, the people who work on farms, right? And uh, the perception, again, is, you know, you might be picking rocks out of a potato line or you might be cleaning out the barn in a dairy operation. But the perception is that the money's not very good there. So you've got kind of, in my mind, anyway, this is the perception. Again, I want you guys to clarify what the reality is, that there's kind of two paths if you're a farmer. You're either the owner and you've got a long-term play okay. with lots of obstacles and risks that you know, over the next 30 years, I'm gonna be able to pay off my loans and at the end of the day, I'm gonna have a, a lot of equity built in this and you know, I've kind of made it and with a lot of hard work and long hours along the way or I'm gonna go work on a farm and I'm probably not gonna make a lot of money and I've got, you know, for example, uh, farmers, dairy operations in my district who said, the only way they can fill positions is with temporary farm workers and they're actually paying them fairly well, often in places to stay, they said, it used to be like two years they'd stay before they got their permanent residency and then they'd inevitably leave, but that process is becoming shorter and they can't find, they can't even find temporary farm workers to work, much less, um, you know, people who are already living on PEI. So I wanted you to talk about the career paths available. I mean, you were talking about support industries for, you know, big farm business, right? But... <clears throat> It, are these myths uh, like farming itself? Is it just big business or, you know, kind of entry level worker, or is there more to it than that? Uh, <laughs> Philip Hamming, uh, there is more to it, and there's yeah. like there's huge amounts of people in the middle who are needed to manage all these high tech places. So you're talking about automation, and as much as the automation. Uh, is you can buy it on PEI, but do you have someone who can service it? So if the company is based in Denmark, in Denmark, sure, you can find someone to come fix your robot milker, but on PEI, it's a little bit more difficult. So there's a huge need for technical people and for managers and for people who are not just picking rocks, but who are also not the owners. And rock picking days are getting pretty... There's, that's automated now, too. Um, uh, milking cows, some of it is and some of it isn't. But th there's, there's a huge breadth of work and need in the industry that is not just menial labor. There's a huge need for qualified technical managers and just support staff in the middle. Just something to yeah, I just wanted to that. follow up. So it, 
I think maybe even the language we use when we talk about getting into farming. Right. That's not what we're really talking about. We're talking about, you know, being a worker in the farm industry. Yes. Or the agricultural industry. And, yeah. I, and I think that's part of what's going on. People in their mind think if I'm going to be in the farm industry, it means I'm going to be the person that owns the farm or I'm going to be a worker on a farm. They forget about everything that surrounds it. So that's, that's good, to, good, to, good to hear about those opportunities. Maybe it's the language that's involved. Yeah. It, okay. It's the most impressive technology on PEI is found in our in our uh, in our fields and in our in our in our processors and our packing sheds. You know, we call them packing sheds. You walk through a packing shed in Prince Edward Island right now, all you see is people walking around looking at their tablets, looking at their phones, managing this thing that's putting out 24/7. It's these, you know, and 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 our biggest farms are employing engineers at a rate that we've never seen before because that's what you need to run these buildings. And we still call them packing sheds. And it's like, you know, optical sorting, you know, I mean, and, and robot arms and like things that you only think, things you think of when you're building cars is how we're, it's how the yeah, little potatoes get to, your, get to your grocery store. Anyway. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, I am going to open up to maybe a couple more questions. Although before I do, I'm going to ask one myself. And it gets back to the Future Farmer Program. Is this program, you know, have, have we seen an increase of people participating in the Future Farmer program? Um, I know what I'm seeing in my district doesn't seem to be, there, there certainly are people participating in it, uh, but I'm wondering is the Future Par Farmer program still meeting what we need to accomplish? So what I'm going to go on, in, is there situations where you, uh, maybe the thresholds, like right now I think you have to have a, develop an income of about gross income of about twenty thousand uh, dollars is the interest rates you know maybe they should be a little bit lower to try to encourage more the thresholds that they can buy more land through the farm financing program you know just little things around that uh, you know if, if there was an improvement to be made to the future farmer program what would the federation of agriculture recommend uh, Philip Hamming. I went through the Future Farm Program, and it was great uh, to have the support from the uh, Department of Agriculture. Um, I, f I found it not to be nimble enough, and the constraints were there, and, um, uh, and then they modified the program and made it much better just as I ended my term yeah. in it. So that was a little annoying. But um, even as it sits now, it's not enough support. Right. It's just, and, th and then other programs for a young farmer, 30 cents on the dollar for X is wonderful, but if you can't afford the 70%, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And so the capital costs to get in are very high, and then and then taking those 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 uh, taking loans out to cover that is is risky, uh, given the extremely risky nature of farming, and it can take a decade to get your feet under you mm -hmm. as a new farmer. So uh, I come from farming people, but I'm a new. I have started my own farm. And I'm, let's say, a decade into it, and it's still hard, and the money's still tight, and I still question why I do it sometimes. And so the support is not at a level. It needs to be more money, longer, and, and more support systems to actually make a difference because, right. because a two-year program or a three-year program isn't going to cut it, especially when you get a Fiona. And I feel like I lost a year to Fiona, mm -hmm. uh, if not just work-wise, spiritually. So it's those <laughs> things that you can't predict. And there's, there always seems to be some new little headache. And uh, so I would say it would... Uh, so basically you, all the thresholds need to be kind of re-looked and rethought. To yeah, try to and maybe tailor-made individual to individual, which I realize would be incredibly difficult. But if you want to have success there, it needs to be made for an individual. Um, I'm not going to come off the street and build a pack shed for uh, five million dollars. Mm. But so that's not that's not feasible. But there is feasible size businesses that could be supported for brand new entrants into the industry. Mm. A any other comments from anybody else? No, I think you know Philip is very clear. That I mean the. the there needs, to be, there needs to be more, more funding, more dollars uh, put into that uh, into that uh, future uh, karma program. And I think the other aspect of it is is very, very clearly we talked about uh, technology. I mean, uh, I can find people to I can find people to pick rocks, but I can't find people to to uh, fix my uh, uh, tractor that's uh, computerized and. Uh, yeah. So that's. 
Okay, I said it opened up to two more questions. So, Jamie, you think you have one that's very pertinent to, to the subject, so I'll ask you first and open up to somebody else. It's a great discussion, Chair, but I, I, I've realized that we, don't, we do a really poor job so. in telling the story. And I think that's somewhere where we need to go. We need to, we need to tell the story of where farming is today to get away from the old thoughts of it's picking rocks and it's cold and it's damp and so on. And I think we need to start to tell that story about, you know, the advancement of technology, the use of robotics in our dairy farms or whatever. You look at Allen Farm Equipment and some of the new stuff out there they're doing with planters and stuff like that. Like in 10 years, Allen Farm Equipment has really jumped forward. Look at link letter welding or, 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 or Rob Lee's or these different welding facilities. Um, I'm thinking about Ray Keenan and Alvin down there, what they've done in their shit. And I think if we start, and, and you know, how the families are involved in it. So how can we work towards, with the Federation, Department of Agriculture, or the Legislative Assembly, or whoever, to tell the story? What would you recommend? How we could tell that story to show the world, this is what we're actually doing. This is not just about going out in an old digger or something like that. Like, tell the whole story from the, basically from the field to the plate. Yeah, I mean, to, to um, Hal Perry's point, uh, we have a program that's designed to do that. And if we were given a mandate to do what you just said and the necessary funding to do it, uh, we've definitely got the expertise and the capacity and the network. It's our, it's our members that, that we ha that we'll, we'll use to tell this story and uh, no question the whether <clears throat> we had our last board meeting at the climate center in st peter's and one of the students there had recently designed and built a prototype of a of an automated sprayer which is you know an opportunity to if you're into building physical things if you're into managing data you know if you want to see if you if you're into building data tools you know whatever level of of um technology you want to be at we need you in agriculture like those are the people we're here trying to attract uh to ron's point so uh, expanding farm and food care and giving it a giving it a strong mandate to uh highlight the career opportunities in Prince Edward Island agriculture um, would be, I think, your best return on investment in trying to tell that story. Okay. Final question to Hilton. Well, you, you covered it, but I guess the, the, about the youth, young farmers program. I was going to touch okay. to that and, okay. and to see, but I did, I thought just a quick one because uh, Ron just happened to mention, are there other provinces that do have that curriculum in their schools? Uh, you, yes, there is other provinces that have uh, you know, that there there is a available curriculum, yeah. and w once again now I don't know whether it's as Carla uh, mentioned I don't know whether it's across the the board or whether it's available at, but there is a uh, uh, various program curriculum available uh, in in provinces. Okay, turn it back to the Federation of Agriculture for your third of your presentation. Certainly, um, this is. Uh, Again, this is this is something that I think the that we need to. It's this is a this is a good topic, and it's it's one that we can make good progress on, and we're starting to see progress on in the grassroots. Uh, it's about it's about cattle on Prince Edward Island, and and uh, to the chair's point about BSE and what happened that happened all across the province uh, from from 2000 to 2021. Uh, you know, we saw our farms reporting beef capital op operations decrease, you know, by almost half. We saw a similar decrease in, head, in heads of, of, of beef cattle. Uh, so this is just beef cattle. Of course, you know, there's lots of dairy cattle on, on Prince Edward Island as well. And uh, in response to this and, and trends elsewhere in livestock, the province did release its livestock strategy in November 2021. The province has had some success with implementing uh, that strategy. Uh, but much like the Land Matters Committee and, and, that, and that plan, there are some critical areas that uh, remain in need of attention. So just an example of a success, Atlantic Beef Products has continued to improve its performance since the strategy was released. And today it has to look beyond PEI to satisfy its capacity, which we talked about with our processors around land use. They don't, they're not getting enough beef, uh, they're not getting enough inputs from PEI. Additionally, uh, their Prince Edward Island certified beef program is consistently sold out. It is unquestionably, uh, the, it's effectively developed a real brand 
uh, for island beef, which was prescribed nice. in the strategy. And so that's really successful. And again, they'll take any farmer that, that's willing to work with them and, and, and can qualify for the certified beef program. Um, you know, they're really, they need, they need more island beef, uh, island beef um, producers. Now, however, a once, uh, one pillar that is critical that has not seen progress is risk management. So I, I, everyone, I hope everyone's familiar with crop insurance. Uh, it's a trusted program that farmers on PEI depend on. Uh, in a year like the one we're in, uh, when historic rainfall destroys the winter wheat crop, crop insurance is there to help the farmers, and, and, and it works. Similar programming does not exist for cattle producers. They are left on their own to manage risk through the multiple seasons it takes to raise an animal. They have no protection against the, the risk of price volatility and the increasing <coughs> impacts of climate change. Uh, earlier this year, uh, our team partnered with the PEI cattle producers to survey their members to help understand what was happening. Uh, and after speaking with approximately 30 cattle producers, we learned that there were three primary barriers to expansion in the cattle sector. Those are the costs, uh, the access to land, and access to labor. Uh, and we were consistently told that if cattle producers had access to low interest capital for purchasing animals, uh, this, would, this would reduce risk and increase the size of the herd on Prince Edward Island. So why is this important? Um, well, you know, inter introducing cattle it back into our cropland is, is, has so many great sustainable outcomes that we, we can't ignore it. Sharing land between livestock and crop production does allow crop producers, um, you know, they, they, they get access to the really valuable nutrients and, and some, of the, some of the things that cattle do to, to cropland is really positive, improves yield, uh, reduces cost of inputs, and really that collaboration uh, between farmers for land, equipment, and services uh, reduces the cost of production and makes us more efficient. Right now, we're working uh, to learn more about what happens when we allow cattle to graze cover crops. It reduces feed requirements for livestock and, and does provide that service for for uh, for crops, crop farmers. You know, because they get the manure incorporated into their cropping land. So diversifying the cropping system to integrate livestock and rotation not only mitigates climate change, but also adapts us and makes us more resilient. It, it, the, it, the provincial government has to consider how it can support this rotational grazing. Uh, it limits the amount of hay needed by the cattle producer. That continues to be difficult. It improves soil health, as I mentioned. It increases soil organic matter and water holding capacity. It reduces water runoff and nutrient loss. And that can really uh, reduce the impact of drought and extreme rain events on crops. So it makes us more resilient. Uh, we, we did some greenhouse gas modeling, as I mentioned. Uh, our emissions are about 315,000 tons uh, annually, and about two-thirds of that comes from dairy and beef cattle. And so we estimate we can reduce our emissions from dairy and beef cattle by up to 100,000 tons uh, by the, from, from the implementation of best management practices, and chief amongst those is rotational grazing. So, you know, alongside those direct benefits on emissions, the production of manure also decreases the need for synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So what I'm saying is that, you know, these opportunities in cattle and crop production and integrating them, you know, it is a really key strategy moving forward. There is ongoing research by industry, by people who are, are working for the Federation, uh, as well as the federal government on the, on the benefits of this integrated cattle and crop production. And there's lots of experimentation happening on farm on PEI right now. But to be successful, we have to be able to expand uh, these exist the existing extension programs that the Department of Agriculture has. The Department of Agriculture has, uh, of all the extension that it does, which is much, much less than it used to be, perhaps the strongest is, is around livestock. I mean, the people in the department who are working there are well respected, they're trusted, and, and they're bringing these new techniques to the farms and the farmers are listening. We really think a lot about how we can connect the cattle farmer with the with the, the cat, people raising cattle with the people producing crops you know and um, and that's a place where the province can help you know we need grazing mentorship we, we need all of our farmers to understand how how to graze animals on their land we need to, they need to understand the economic benefits uh, to their yields elsewhere in their rotation and and you know making cattle a part of the crop rotation on PEI will not only uh, make our crop production more resilient but it will help increase the cattle sector uh, we've been implementing the On-Farm Climate Action Fund for the last two years. Uh, we've awarded almost $6 million, much of that in rotational grazing projects. We're doing everything we can to get the community pastures uh, improved uh, and, and our, to get, allow our cattle producers to, to improve their, 
their, um, to improve their grazing um, practices. Uh, if and when that funding, uh, that federal funding ends, the provincial government should be ready uh, with similar infrastructure uh, investments around solar wells, water storage systems, uh, permanent and temporary fencing, waterway and roadway crossing infrastructure, you know, really helping uh, us raise cattle on cropland is, is what the future is going to look like and how we're going to grow the herd. And, you know, we, we hear about you know, I don't know, but I hear a lot about the romantic, you know, people romanticize the island mixed farm, you know, that, that, and, and, and the fact is that we can't, our economic impact is derived from our specialization. You know, that was the big change in agriculture is that we, we had more specialization and we've grown, you know, into the largest industry in the island and, and we have a tremendous economic impact. And now it's interesting because the opportunity is to take a province-wide approach and, and the province, you know, we need to, by reintegrating cattle and crop production, you know, we, these sort of historical tried and true methods are actually going to grow our economic impact, decrease our environmental impact, and make our farmers more resilient. And so it's, it's the very definition of sustainability and it's, uh, it's really the key to, um, I think, growing growing um, the herd, you know, alongside, again, that access to capital that, um, that our farmers need to, and, and the risk management piece. Okay, thanks. Actually, it's a subject near and dear to my heart as a former beef producer, and, uh, and uh, I think I, I've been sort of advocating for some time to increase our livestock numbers definitely need to happen. So anyway, I'll start off with Hal Perry, then we'll go Carla, Hilton, Jamie. Okay, uh, thanks Chair. So yeah, it was great to talk about um, how to help um, beef farmers uh, expand their herd, because um, it, it is much needed, especially to keep the Atlantic beef plant um, operational. Um, but with that, the dairy industry also sometimes faces um, um, headwinds every time there's a, a, a new trade agreement, right, and there's a price adjust, adjustment. So. What are some of the other challenges that dairy farmers may, um, or that we should be mindful of? And because, I mean, they also use some of their um, um, dairy cattle as a finishing product for the, the, the beef plant, too. More all the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ron Maynard. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an opportunity out there, and it's, it's, uh, we're seeing it now is the, the uh, use of what we call dairy beef. And that mm -hmm. is on um, my farm, uh, and we've used, we breed half our, uh, our Holsteins to uh, beef, uh, uh, and therefore, you know, before when we had uh, Holstein uh, bull calves that would go to Quebec for veal, uh, mm -hmm. now we're, we've got uh, these beef calves that are in, in demand on Prince Cedar Island, and so I think, you know, this is the aspect of, there's two aspects to the beef industry in Prince Cedar Island. One aspect is the cow-calf operation. Uh, those are decreasing quite dramatically. You know, uh, Fiona last year, unfortunately, uh, brought down a number of older barns that where farmers were had you know 20 or 30 cattle, beef cattle in there that they were using to for a cow-calf operation. You know, so we're seeing less of those. So the dairy industry has kind of picked that up, and I think it's going to continue to pick that up as as this practice becomes more uh, more broadly. Uh, used of uh, you know, uh, tracking your genetics, uh, dividing your herd into say the top uh, a third and, and the bottom two thirds, uh, using sex semen for uh, for the top third. Therefore, you're guaranteed of having uh, heifer calves, and the others uh, you'll be breed to beef. And so I think it's a source of uh, of uh, 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 what we're seeing is a lack of, of beef animals on Prince Edward Island. You know, we see. Now feedlots are getting back in uh, uh, Griffins uh, up to uh, uh, Tignish the other day. You know, there hasn't been cattle in there for many, many years. You know, they've they've got their their facilities back full again because they realize uh, this is Griffins that's just outside of uh, Albert. Uh, you know, they realize the importance of uh, of having a as Donald just says the combination of livestock and and cropping. They're most certainly still growing potatoes in a big way. But they're, you know, they're back into saying, yeah, we need those beef cattle, and we need so to find those cattle to fill uh, feed lots is a is a is a challenge. Thank you. Follow up or clarity. Good. Carla, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I don't, I don't think I have a question. This may lead to one, but um, it, this has been really interesting. Thank you for coming in, um, especially as I consider this topic one that I don't know a whole lot about, um, and so. 
it's interesting to me how much, you know, if, as we consider an industry like agriculture that relies so heavily on climate, I'm not sure, I'm, I mean, there are other industries that rely heavy, heavily on it. However, agriculture, I think in particular, because every aspect of it relies on the weather. And so it's been really interesting to me to hear some of these innovative things that, that agriculture is doing to kind of to keep up with the times and, and to ensure the viability of the, the, the industry. And we have to act fast to do these things. And so it's not lost on me when we talk about the loss of farmland, when we talk about um, the idea of crop um, and uh, cattle rotation, we got to act fast on these things or those opportunities are going to be lost. And that's not lost on me. So I just really wanted to thank you for, for coming in today. I don't, I don't have a question. Just yeah. if I may, Ron Maynard, something you know that, that you mentioned about uh, we, we have done in the past and I think we should take a look at it for now is, is to tour uh, for uh, MLAs, uh, the opportunity to get out there and to, you know, we just, we had our North American EU Farmers Conference here last week uh, in, uh, at the Delta where we had 250 delegates from, uh, uh, U from the U.S., from Mexico and from, uh, from Europe and well as Canada. You know, uh, the tour we had last Thursday was... Uh, you know, to uh, some leading uh, uh, agricultural places between Charlottetown and Summerside, uh, things like the Living Labs that we're doing, uh, 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 things like uh, the ADL, uh, Wyman's uh, 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 Blueberry people, you know, to show really what agriculture is. And so I think, uh, you know, that's something that we, uh, we've done it in the past. It's been a number of years ago now, but we had a media and MLA uh, tour, and I think that's something that we may look at uh, so it'll be on the agenda for our next board meeting, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to cl clarify, we are planning on a tour of the beef plant, but uh, that's uh, Good. Uh, on our agenda. But anyway, Hilton McLennan? Uh, it's something like, um, I know the chair has been advocating for it. I've been advocating to actually is uh, the some kind of insurance program for price of the beef cattle. Um, I think it would make a tremendous, tremendous uh help to the industry, I will, I will say that. Um, the other um, thing, you touched on community pastures. Is there more that we can be doing? Because there's a lot of that pasture land, and I used to be part of a community pasture. There's a lot, I, don't, I guess it's mostly finances not being used, so is there more support that we can do to help, um, you know, in some ways, uh, bring a lot of that pasture land back into production, like, or, or use for pasture? Yeah, I, 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 I think so. I mean, you know, we, we see uh, pasturing was, was kind of, you put, the, you put the cows at one time and they, they had, you know, they were in that field for the year. But we're seeing rotational grazing, and I think that's the opportunity. But in order to do that, you need infrastructure. You need to have your, you know, your fences where you're looking at, and where before maybe you would have a 50-acre field, you know, now what you have to have is you have to have, you know, 10 5-acre fields so that you can rotate those cattle, you know, on a, every three or four days, five days, depending on what the, you know, this, this year is not an issue, but in most, a lot of years, you know, it's the, it's, you have to have that ability to move your, move your animals and you have to have the infrastructure to, to do it. So that's the, you know, helping with infrastructure for community pastures would be, I think, a positive uh, uh, is a manager with yeah. two, yeah. Um, being able to hire somebody. And yeah. to well, say, once again, that's a, la a labor aspect and technology, yeah. and, and, and you say the, the abilities uh, are, are, uh, are a challenge. If I may, Donald Kalorn, just yesterday we had a, a, someone raising cattle uh, up towards Tignish who... Um, uses the wants to you know uses the community pasture up that way and we've been as i said um distributing funding across prince edward island for two years now to uh for three things one of which is grazing improved grazing rotational grazing and we really went into that wanting to drive funds to the community pasture we put special um we put special conditions around the funding for instance um most most projects don't get paid until they're completed. Community pasture, we were willing to put 50% up front because of the challenges we understood they're having. Still hasn't been enough to get projects off the ground. We approved the projects. 
Um, the projects get applied for thanks largely to provincial staff like Les Halliday who's doing the extension and uh, and then when it's time to do it because of the governance because of the not being able to come up with a 15% match that they need or any of the cash flow they need <coughs> even with an advance you know we're still seeing opportunities missed uh, to improve community pastures with this federal funding that's designed perfectly to do that. So now we've started, just yesterday, we, we agreed to work with one of the users of the community pasture. Um, funding will run through their business. They'll still be responsible for completing it, but the community pasture is so important to, to their operation that um, you know they're applying for a project to do work on the community pasture. You know, and when they're done, you know, if they st choose to stop, the pasture will derive all that benefit from it. But that's the state of the nation is that um, the pastures still don't have the capacity and the governance to come up with 15 percent of a project and implement a project that's just about putting up fences, getting watering, you know, getting watering infrastructure out there. We we should be implementing the on farm climate action fund at least for one more year. I don't think it'll change too much. And we have to be sure we get these projects and maximize these projects in community pastures. So if the province came to the table and guaranteed the other 15 percent, you know, that would be that would be a great way to do that. So the feds will pick up 85 cents on the dollar and and we can we can rejuvenate all these pastures next year and come away with it with renewed infrastructure. Any clarification questions? Or okay. uh, Jamie Fox. Thanks, Chair. I, I, I highly agree with up in our cattle. As I hear, I have a lot of cattle in my area, and of course I have land beef right there too. So I, I constantly hear it about we need to up that the cattle and our things. But one question I have, I guess, is I'm sort of two questions. The first one is um, how do we compete with um, Quebec coming down to the land of Canada and basically subsidizing cattle sales or bought purchases? How do we combat that? How do we stop? them cattle from leaving the land of Canada and going to the province of Quebec or the province of Ontario. Well, I think, I think the, Ron Maynard here again, things like what's happening in Griffin's up there. They're going there because people aren't, you know, people aren't, weren't, there wasn't buyers for it on Prince Edward Island. And so I think what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that, uh, and this is, you know, we have a Prince Edward Island living labs. Mm. which is for crops. What we need is for living labs for livestock. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's, that's something that's, it will, you know, we see what the living labs has done for, for uh, crop and, and, and uh, you know, demonstration uh, projects that they have going. We need the same for livestock. Mm. Okay, okay follow-up question? Yeah, um, the problem, the problem I'm, like I sort of wonder about and in hearing is that if we put more land out to more cattle out the land for pasture and grazing, then usually that goes up to public auction or people have the ability to to bid on it, and then the same thing happens again. Like that, that, that cattle goes off island. So I'm wondering how do we how do we guarantee that to get these numbers up in PEI? How do we support the feedlock industry, or what should we be doing to support that feedlock industry? Well, Don Kalorn, the again, the what I've heard from cattle producers is there's no the, the act the supporting them in the purchase of of live like livestock. I, I guess I'm I'm not I think I understand your question because once. We j we're happy to sell to the highest bidder, mm. but you, you're, you're trying to... Are you talking about sort of cattle when they're at 600 pounds and keeping them on Prince Edward Island rather than leaving, or are you talking about when sold Finish the processing? Off. Yeah, so if, if there was a program that allowed Prince Edward Islanders to, um, you know, again, it's access to, to favorable capital. You know, if you're buying, a, if you're buying a, an animal and paying 8% on it, it's difficult to to turn a profit, but if you're if you have access to something a little more favorable, um, you know they'll be more apt to. They certainly have the capacity to to finish more animals, and so that that's what I've heard from producers is simply access to low interest capital. Hmm. The other the other aspect I think is your colleague answered. Ron Maynard, okay. Uh, uh, Susie Dillon. Uh, insurance. Uh, yeah. Insuring the 
you know, Hilton mentioned about crop about insurance, uh, mm. uh, you know, and I think if you dig deep enough, you may find that's available within the province of Quebec. Okay. Uh, just to clarify, I think actually a price insurance program exists in many provinces. <laughs> We're, the, we're one of the few that don't, or the mayor times tend to be one of the few that don't. But yes. anyway, uh, Brad, Trevor. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and so um, it's, it sounds like we're, we're seeing potato farmers that are getting into beef because the prices are high enough and they can see the value added proposition from what it's, you know, grazing can help with their land. And we're also seeing dairy who are getting into beef because, again, the price is high and they're seeing value proposition there. But our cow calf operations of pure beef. Are suffering because they have to deal with the risk and it's already been brought up about this price assurance idea um, so when it comes to rotational grazing I mean there there obviously are some barriers there like I can't imagine like what I see in my area is they're ripping out um, you know barriers to fields to make them bigger because of the bigger equipment but now we're saying oh we're gonna need to put fences back in there and watering holes like what and maybe you said this and I missed it but what what overarching body maybe it is the Federation of Agriculture is actually taking these players, bringing them together, and leading the discussion and, and asking for the money and um, examining this whole area of, of rotational grazing, and it would leak into beef prices as well. Like, is there one? Do you have a have a a committee or a board or something that contains those players that's looking at this right now? Well, we Donald Kalorn, we have. Um, you know, there's the there's um, at the at the regional level, the maritime grazing. There's a lot of extension happening there, uh, and research happening there. Um, the actual integration is happening pretty organically between different producers who are aware of the benefits. Um, so the the uh, you know, it's arrived in the on farm climate action fund. It, which is a $700 million program across Canada, is one of the three things that we can spend that money on. So that it arrived there as one of the climate best practices that with a little, with a little bit of funding can be implemented effectively across Canada and makes a difference, uh, really moves the needle on greenhouse gas emissions and sequestering carbon. So that's how it ended up in OFCAF. And once it was there, um, I think that drove a lot of interest in, okay, what can we really do with this? Because you've got, you know, you've got cattle producers who who are adopting this, like Nick Green, Kingston View Farms, who, who has a really extensive knowledge and, and is a leader and is actually hosting a grazing tour today. But, um, you know, it's kind of happening, it is happening at the grassroots through a number of different avenues. And, you know, we, we support people, we employ people who are working on it and getting, getting the word out and doing the research. But I wouldn't say there's one single entity that's that's driving it um, in in Prince Edward Island um, or even in the Maritimes. There's a lot of different. There's a lot of overlap. The provincial government of Prince Edward Island has been very active in developing grazing workshops and trying to get the word out about what can be gained from uh, from improved grazing practices. And so again, it really is a, a grassroots, multi-stakeholder um, approach that is, and it's just beginning. You know, and and we're trying to champion it. Uh, here today and, and in a lot of media that we do so that people understand that it's coming and it needs support and it has a, a lot of potential for Prince Edward Island but it really is coming from a, diff a few different players. Clarification, R Ron Maynard. Just something I, and you know the extension is what we I think what we're what we are lacking. I mean if we go back you know many many years ago the Department of Agriculture had had extension people uh, in every you know in O'Leary and Summerside and Charlottetown and in Morrell and, and Surrey. Those people aren't there anymore. And so what we're seeing unfortunately is is as you know new technology comes along, it used to be, you know, uh, seven years for it to be adopted on the farm. You know, with the majority of the of the of the people. Now we're seeing that gone to ten. And, you know, there used to be people that coming into the you know there's, there's people that are, like, I would consider myself a lead farmer. I, I travel, I see things, I do things. You know, it's the next people that are on the farm all the time. How do we get those people to, to adopt things? And it used to be that there was an extension person coming to the farm, helping them with, you know, 
telling them, okay, Ron Maynard did this, you know. Well, this was, you know, he, this this idea flopped for Ron Maynard, but this idea was a good idea, and so he's, you know, he's yeah. he's following yeah. it. And so people, you know, people that are on the farm all the time will look at other farmers for for guidance, and you, know, you need extension people to mm. get that message out there. To clarification on your question, yeah. I think there's a role if it's not the provincial government, then there is there a role for the federation to do mm. that. With with Brad Trivers. Funding, of course, do that. So when when it comes to uh, to research, a lot of times it's post secondary institutions that can lead the way on that front. And you already mentioned the the Canadian Centre for Climate Change, for example, UPEI. But we don't have an agricultural college on PEI. And this was sort of mentioned earlier as well. Um, but I know Holland College has research. Um, you know, people dedicated to pursuing research, and if you had an agricultural program on PEI, that they could be the ones that could lead in areas like this, in in conjunction with the Canadian Centre for Climate Change. So I just wanted to get that out there, okay. chairs, as a, a potential direction forward to help consolidate all these different groups through a, you know, sort of a research branch to take some of these initiatives and get them off the ground. Just throwing that okay, out thanks. there. The Canadian Centre has a is lucky to have uh, Adizaz Farouk who is leading a lot of the agricultural research, but it is very focused on crop production. And uh, when we were there last uh, few weeks ago for our board meeting, uh, one message we delivered was we'd love to see more work around cattle. And again, the reason being, we can reduce our emissions by 140,000 tons per year in agriculture. Um, 100,000 of that is in cattle. Right, so that's where the real net zero opportunity is in agriculture is in cattle, and if that's what they're doing out there, then that's what they we'd like them to be looking at that as well. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just have one little follow up question here that I want to talk a little bit of, and it could t t touches a bit on the price assurance. But uh, the two big issues that I sort of see with uh, livestock and getting into cattle would be right now prices are at an all time high for beef, and uh, so the price assurance thing. It keeps coming back all the time. It keeps getting mentioned. Other provinces have implemented. For what reason, why can't it get implemented here in Prince Edward Island? And the other impact on the profitability of a beef operation that we're impacted here in PEI is the seven cents back of Ontario at the beef plant, right? So those two things have factors in that. Why, why is that still continuing? I, I understand how it was implemented. And what would be some suggestions that could, because that's a seven cent disadvantage that, because the cost of production here for beef is probably a little higher than it is in other provinces, yet we're caught with that seven cents back of Ontario. I think, you know, that you should, the next person, one of the other people you should have in is the Cattlemen Association. Yes. The other aspect that you should be talking to is there's just newly elected a gentleman named Nathan Kenny. Uh, who is the new president of the Canadian Cattle Association, lives from in New Brunswick and between Port Elgin and Sackville. And I'm sure he would you know, uh, oh, be more, more than willing to come across and, and speak to you and, and about the beef industry. And, and you know, uh, that would be my, my suggestion. I mean, when you're getting down to those specific uh, mm -hmm. detailed aspects of, it, of the beef industry, then you know, my knowledge is, is right. not there. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, now we're just about 12 o'clock, so we have some options here. But thank you. Have another? Do you have the Fiona? The final one is Fiona. It's probably the shortest. Yeah. Um, so do we want to proceed with that? Uh, I'm thinking we would. Maybe try to wrap it up by 12:30. Um, general agreement to that? Yes. Okay. So we'll proceed with your fourth. Uh, Yes, so the, the fourth item was an update on Hurricane Fiona and its impact on agriculture. Uh, it was, uh, by, by, by some metrics, the most powerful storm to make landfall in Canada's history. Uh, our farms on Prince Edward Island suffered catastrophic damage. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is aware of that. Uh, the province of Prince Edward Island, the government of Prince Edward Island, responded with the $17 million uh, Fiona Agriculture Support Program. Uh, the program was well received by island farmers. Uh, they found it to be well thought out and designed to address their needs. Uh, they did feel like, uh, you know, it didn't fully address their financial needs, but the way the program was designed uh, addressed what needed to, the money needed to be spent on. But certainly the $17 million didn't come close to, uh, to covering their losses. Uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, did have to build new capacity to administer that funding. Uh, and as such, there were delays in farms receiving the funds, but today those funds have begun to arrive on island farms. So um, that program, you know, it's, we, don't hear, we don't hear much issue um, with that program, and I think generally it, it was well done. 
Uh, following the devastation, federal representatives were quick to connect with our farmers. Uh, our organization hosted uh, the Agriculture Agri-Food Canada Minister at the time, Marie-Claude Bibeau, and uh, her colleagues on Prince Edward Island, uh, and the devastation was still very clear, very present. Uh, there was a show of support that day from the federal government. However, after a full year of waiting, there has been no actual financial support from the government of Canada. So we haven't received any sort of matching funds to the $17 million the province put on the table. There was $300 million put into, uh, $300 million put into the Fiona Response Fund, which is managed by ACOA. Uh, funds from that uh, have been provided to both fishing and aquaculture. Uh, however, none of those dollars have been allocated for support to agriculture. Uh, agriculture and Agri-Food Canada chose instead to try and use one of the existing business risk management programs they have called Agri-Recovery to try and assist farmers. But that, that program is not designed to provide the type of support that our farmers need. And to date, no dollars have arrived from the federal government, as I say. I might say it a few more times. Uh, while Farm Credit Canada, Farm Credit Canada has been willing to assist farmers. I've heard anecdotally that they have been, uh, you know, they have worked with our farmers uh, effectively. But however, you know, we consistently see public money invested to assist with uh, disaster recovery. Uh, inexplicably, we cannot seem to secure federal dollars to match the 17 million that the province has put in, and uh, we we are starting to hear now. A, a year later, we're starting to hear about the uninsured losses that are really starting to drag down our island operations. There is still a, a serious need um, for more investment in Fiona response. The dollars remain with ACOA, uh, remain earmarked to do exactly what we need them to do. And do you want me to go back? Uh, exactly what we need them to do. <laughs> and uh, somewhere between <laughs> Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, um, you know, the, the message is being lost. And, and we've reached out to the minister. Uh, again, we've had a change in, in ministers, um, but we reached out to the previous minister and, and we're basically, we didn't get any satisfaction at all. Um, so uh, specifically you asked about the fruit tree growers and that is a, a sector that it has felt, uh, it was really dealt a critical blow by Hurricane Fiona. Uh, it was a burgeoning industry. Uh, and when the storm arrived, uh, the industry really hadn't reached full maturity. Uh, many producers were just beginning to produce a commercial crop. And uh, the danger of that is that they weren't yet eligible for crop insurance because they didn't have the documented uh, sales yet. They were just coming up. You know, I think it takes five years for those trees to become commercial. But they were dealt a critical blow to their infrastructure, which is the trees. Those were decimated by the storm, and there has not been sufficient investment made to restore that capital. You know, you really have to think of those trees as their capital. And so not only did they lose their crop, they lost their infrastructure. And, uh, you know, they've had meetings, I know, directly with ACOA, uh, with AAFC, but um, have not received uh, any federal dollars to support them alongside what the province did. So that's where we're at with Fiona. I did want to mention to this group that uh, the last time we appeared before it, we did request support for a agricultural specific climate change adaptation plan. This was immediately after Fiona. Uh, I'm happy to report that we did receive that support from the provincial government. We have begun to engage our commodity groups um, in, in the development of that plan. Uh, we're on the path of producing a very strong plan, uh, the likes of which we haven't seen yet in, in provincial agriculture in Canada. Uh, and we will be able to build and track resilience of our sector to climate change. Uh, I think we can make great strides in protecting our industry from future impacts. Uh, identifying opportunities uh, that result from climate change and uh, help to ensure the sustainability of Prince Edward Island agriculture. So that's um, that's it for Fiona. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Hilton, start it off. Well, that was, um, I guess you answered some of my question, all right, because um, it was, uh, I've been hearing a lot from fruit growers and the western part seemed to be not too bad, the eastern part of the island, and, the, and they're being devastated. They have not received anything. Um, so I guess you, what you're saying, it's mostly, right now, it's mostly a federal, uh, it's a federal run um, through disaster relief. Yes, again, there was $300 million put into a federal, uh, with, was given, was, was allocated to ACOA to manage by the federal government. Uh, we saw $100 million go to, uh, wharves and harbors, 
Uh, 40 million went to shellfish producers, and uh, we have not yet seen any money come from uh, ag uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And um, it's entirely possible that that's a failing of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, not of ACOA. Um, mm. And so those are questions that we have to um, ask our federal, our federal MPs uh, now, because, and uh, as well our new minister, uh, we've asked for more clarity and are waiting on that as well. It's just <laughs> <Great>. uh, <laughs> uh, the former minister Fishers has been licking his chops here yeah. for this question, so I'll, I'll, I'll allow him a que the, the next question. Go ahead. But oh, you're, you're, yes. Wow. <laughs> you get the next question. So you wow. licking your chops. You're not telling me anything that's not echoing what happened in the fisheries and the aquaculture industry. They actually haven't received any money yet either. I'm told. They flew in here, they made a, made a big announcement out at um, Prince Edward Island Aqua Farms about all this money. And I'm told from the fishing and harbors that right from Tignish, right down the other side, the only money going into repairs is from A and B funding of DFO. So what you're telling me on the agriculture industry is no surprise. Has any of the federal MPs been in contact with the Federation? Or have they lobbied for you to get the money rolling from Ottawa down to our agriculture industry? We're a year and a half later. Yeah. No, it seems to be a, a Ottawa's bureaucracy seems to have <laughs> gobbled it up. Gobbled it up. I shouldn't <laughs> say that, but anyway, sh sh shuffling from one uh, one to the other. But what, what we're hearing at any rate is, is that, and, and I wasn't aware that the, uh, we thought that the fisheries and wharves had been, had been uh, 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 the dollars at least had been allocated. I mean, uh, we're not even at that stage. Uh, yeah, I, I think just to clarify, as far as I'm aware too, the aquaculture industry hasn't received any money yet either. They're, they're going through with the process, but, uh, but anyway. So I'm going to go to Hal Perry next. Um, I could kind of thrown off by that one a little bit. But so there was no federal response to this, but was there an, an, an ask? And if there was an ask, who was advocating for, um, for agriculture here in Prince Edward Island? Was it the Federation? Did you guys have an ask to the federal government? Did the province have an ask uh, to the federal government? Donald Kalorn, the, the provincial government <coughs> makes the decision about whether to put in a claim under agri-recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, the federal AAFC is responsible for requesting the funds from ACOA. So those, those are the two sort of pathways. Nova, we, the, we had a very, provincially, and again it was the provincial government, provincially we had a very poor response through agri-recovery after Hurricane Dorian. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of work put in by the federation and the, and the, and the department collaboratively to put together a claim that was then systematically denied wholly, so no dollars flowed from that program. As such, uh, there wasn't a great interest in going down the agri-recovery path again, provincially. Uh, Nova Scotia did move forward with a claim. Um, I, I don't believe we ultimately moved forward with a claim, but Nova Scotia's claim again was systematically reduced down to I think a million dollars. And, and uh, they also provincially put up about 17 million, and have now come to the table with um, an additional, an additional. Um, the number escapes me, but the, much of it was awarded to the Federation of Agriculture. That's how I know about it. But they've come with a second tranche of funding now because of the delay uh, with federal dollars, and seemingly, from the minister's response to our letter, Minister Bebo's. The million dollars that they receive from agri recovery will be the the extent of federal funding we can expect from its Fiona response. They didn't address the ACOA dollars at all through AFC. So um, their provincial government has come with a second tranche, and uh, and we continue to work collaboratively with the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture to try and secure some of these ACOA dollars for agriculture in the region. Okay. 
a clarification no, question? No, no, that's great okay. to hear. But I just want to mention, though, there has been, uh, I know it was mentioned that it was down east, some of the fruit tree growers were more impacted. But I know in my district, in Tignish, there is one uh, yeah. farm that was just a terrible tragedy uh, to their farm. And they were uh, new into it. I think they might have been in the second year of their crop. So it, it was impacted island-wide. And uh, I do think there's a huge need for um, some supports, whether it be federal, provincial, or whatever. For these industries, yes. thank you. Okay, Carla Bernard, Chair, thank you're good. You. Okay, uh, Susie. Yeah. Okay, uh, Bradley Trivers. Um, so, it is kind of disturbing to to hear that the access to financial help wasn't there. I was just wondering um, whether you felt the response of the the PEI disaster financial assistance program uh, played a, a, a role in, in helping uh, farmers. If you're familiar with that one, so that I, I mean, I've heard that it, there was funds that uh, were applied for that still haven't been approved even at this point for some of my constituents. But yeah. the, the difficult Donald Kalorn, the difficulty with that program is the two million dollar cap on the on the revenues, and so that um, if your if your business grossed more than two million dollars in a year, then it was not eligible for that program, okay. and that is a I believe that's a contingency that that comes because with the federal, their federal, a lot of their federal dollars, um, and that that requirement comes with them attached to them, and so there was little we could do. We we had conversations with the Department of Agriculture about those dollars, communicated the limitation, and couldn't um, couldn't do anything to get around it. Uh, so that's my understanding with the with the, with those particular funds, and why there was the 17 million uh, outside of that program that was made available to agriculture. Okay. The other Ron Meter. The other aspect is that I think that they did, they are working on it. I mean, uh, I put in a second claim for another for tree removal the other just the other day. Uh, so I mean, I I think that it is, and. To their credit, I guess, is that they are looking at each specific case. You know, I mean, it's easy for for a certain program. Uh, you know, if it's a if it's a future farmer program and it's an interest to uh, you know uh, assistance. All right, you've got a hundred thousand dollars. You're two thousand. You know, you're dropping by by your interest by two percent. That's a pretty simple program to administer. But if you're talking about this with the, with the scope that was uh, the damage caused by Fiona, you know. Uh, you know, the damage that I had is different from what Hilton yeah. had, is different from what Robbie may have had, it's most certainly different from what some of my colleagues, the colleagues in the eastern part of Prince Edward Island had. So I think, and that's a, a compliment, I think, to the program is that they're looking at each specific case and saying, all right, you know, how does your particular, uh, you know, I was without power for, for 48 hours, you were without power for 48 hours, you know. My uh, my friend in uh, Danny McKinnon in Brooklyn was out without power for 14 days. Yeah. So I mean, my needs and his needs are, are quite uh, dramatic. So differently. Mm, okay. Any other questions? So that basically brings oh, <laughs> Jamie Fox. The last uh, last question goes to you. It's just la kind of go off on a different topic. We can go and whatever. I'm very interested in one thing. Does there need to be a review of CFIA and how it looks at our farming industry and the economic associated with it? There's a loaded that, question. That, 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 that's another. Uh, that's another visit from yeah. Yeah. to yes. the legislature. Yeah. Yes, I mean we've we've said that yeah CFIA needs to have uh, a, a reality check. Thank and you very echoed, much. That's and echoed that, by provinces across the and country. And that's echoed by provinces. The CFA has, has uh, the Federation of Agriculture has, has looked at that and said, yeah, you know, there's, there's the reality is, and we've seen it in our, with our potato wart uh, issue, you know, is that when we went to the states, in Canada, we deal with CFIA. If we go to the states and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they've got their scientists, they've got their export, their economists there, they've got their trade people there, you know. Uh, they look at the whole aspect of it, where CFIA just looks like, you know, as I've said, you know, it's a little scary to think that CFIA scientist is looking in his microscope and you know, doesn't realize that his lab is burning around him. It's and become a legitimate risk to the sustainability of Canadian agriculture. 
because we, we, you know, we need CFIA to you know, verify our, our imports and our expo ex exports and imports, uh, and you know, there's a challenge, there's a challenge there, so. Okay, well, that, that basically concludes uh, today's meeting. Uh, I'll just do a little bit of wrap up under new business here. Is there anything that anybody wants to bring up before we adjourn? Yes. Jamie Fox. I would be very interested in hearing more about a recommendation around a living lab for the agriculture industry or for, for cattle. I w that would be something that I'd be interested in. Well, okay, and it could be one of our recommendations, right. but we certainly haven't had tours in the past, and we are going for a tour of the beef plant. We kind of got that. We don't have a date yet picked and things of that nature, but that's one of the things that we're going up, and we are working towards some of our other meetings. Uh, Les has been doing pretty good work on that. Um, so, so yeah, so, we'll, I mean, we'll add that to our list, mm. but, I mean, it's, uh, once again, we can still only do so much, right? Yep. <laughs> So. Is, is that something you'd like the department to speak to, see if that would be possible? Because I know they are willing to come in later in October, so I can add, flag that with them to mm, see if they can yeah, speak okay. to it. Yeah. Okay, so if there's any, do I, can I call for an adjournment? No, for adjournment. Jamie Fox's meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.